Welcome back to the Anchored Podcast, the official podcast of the Classic Learning Test. My name is Soren Schwab, VP of Partnerships here at CLT, and today we are joined by Jake Whiteman. Jake is a professional artist and certified as one of only nine master penmen in the world. Jake was certified through IMPETH, which is the International Association of Master Penmen, Engrossers, and Teachers of Handwriting, in July 2011. He holds the title as the youngest master penman by three decades and is the youngest to ever attain the title. A few of Jake's peers have done work for the White House, Queen Elizabeth, and even the Pope. His journey into calligraphy has been the quote-unquote special sauce for everything he now creates, incorporating the traditional calligraphic flourishing into his fine art. Jake is self-taught in each of his disciplines, calligraphy, painting, drawing, woodworking, and engraving. While he typically works with private clients, Jake has worked with Apple, Crossway Books, and Biola University, and has spoken on countless stages, including TEDx and Think, and was even featured on PBS television. And Jake, it is such an honor to have you on Anchor today. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you. Yeah, I mean, one of, I don't even know where to start. I have so many questions, but we, we, we got to be disciplined here and start with uh, the question I always ask first uh, of our guests, uh, talk to us a little bit about your own educational journey. I, I read in the bio you were self-taught as a master penman, but I assume you were not self-taught in, in all things school. So uh, what kind of schools did you attend? Were you homeschooled? Did you go to public, private school? Uh, yes, man. Um, well, to give you a very brief brief synopsis, I, I uh, did um, a lot of like private Christian school growing up and then did a stint um, of homeschooling from like second grade up till about like sixth grade. Um, and that was really, that was really wonderful. And um, I was homeschooled with some of my other siblings. There were four of us. So my oh, wow. mom certainly had her hands full. Um, and then uh, I went to public school for high school and then uh, went to Biola University to get my degree in psychology. And uh, all the while, I never actually received any formal training in art. Um, I mean, outside of the master penman program, where you're essentially an apprentice to one of the other existing masters uh, for a minimum of a year, um, outside of that, I had no uh, no training as an artist. So everything else was, was just self-taught, a lot of uh, experimentation. Wow. Was your home, your parents, your siblings, were there, was there a lot of art around you? Was it just something you were, you were immersed in, in art and beauty? Or was it really something that your mom looks back to and said, I, I have no idea how Jake turned out the way he did. That was, that was uncharacteristic. <laughs> uh, probably, probably more of that. Um, <laughs> you know, there was, there was very little, um, artistic influence in my family. My mom maybe had just a little bit of it. Uh, she had really beautiful handwriting, was, which was deeply inspiring to me, as did my grandma. Um, but, uh, but my other siblings, you know, really showed no interest in art, really had no talent for art whatsoever. So in that, in that regard, I was very much kind of, you know, going it alone. Um, and there was no, no real precedent for it within my family lineage. Uh, but it was just something that that I loved. I took to right away and always came naturally. It was it was my favorite pastime and my closest friend, you know, growing up. And it was just something I loved to do. Wow. And so, so you mentioned you went to Biola, which is, by the way, one of our our CLT partner colleges. We just had a, a podcast with um, oh, wonderful uh, two folks from the Tory Honors College not not long yeah. ago. And yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place there out in California. Uh, but tell us about your journey to becoming a master penman. I, I, I told you kind of in the pre-recording that I wasn't even aware that there are master penmen, let alone that there are only nine in, left in the world. Um, how did you learn about this? And then kind of what is the process to become a, a master penman? You mentioned apprenticeship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it actually happened while I was at Biola getting my degree in psychology. Um, I can still remember sort of the, uh, the day uh, that, you know, started me down this, uh, this rabbit's hole. I was in cognitive psychology class and there was a, a girl sitting next to me who was engaged to be married. And, and she said, um, at the end of class, she pulled me aside and said, Hey, I, I'm getting married right now. I need somebody to, you know, write my invitations. I've been sitting next to you, watching you write these beautiful notes 
and I've gone through a slew of calligraphers and I like your handwriting the most. And I was like, well, look, I'm using a ballpoint pen. I have no <laughs> idea, you know, how to actually do like true calligraphy, but you know, it's, it's something that I've always, I've always wanted to do. Cause at that point I was just mimicking different fonts and different historic handwritings um, that I had seen uh, but without really understanding, you know, the types of tools that they were using, the techniques, or knowing any of the fundamental forms. So, so that night, I went back to my dorm room and did a deep search on the internet and just started poking around, trying to find, you know, these old historic forms of calligraphy. And, um, and I stumbled upon this video on YouTube of uh, one of the existing master penmen, John DeColibus, who is the greatest... Um, live, or greatest living ornamental penman. And um, he was doing some like demonstrations with this crazy instrument, uh, which I, you know, have now come to know and love. And it's like an extension of my body, but it was, it's this awkward tool called an oblique pen holder that holds the nib off to the side. And it's a dip style pen, but it's made specifically for, you know, beautiful script calligraphy. And, you know, I saw these, these videos, which, you know, were very grain, grainy and, and not very well produced, but still I was absolutely entranced in what I saw. And, um, and so, you know, I then learned that he was a master penman and, um, that there was this association keeping the art form alive. And so, um, further down the rabbit's hole, I went and, uh, and just never looked back. It was just this beautiful discovery, um, that I, just was chasing with everything that I could, even though I was still um, diligently chipping away at my degree. Um, <laughs> at so how, how long then um, from, from that moment? And I, I love that you still remember that exact moment when it's like, wow, this is something I, I want to do to, um, to becoming a master penman. I mean, was that, was this month? Was that years? Um, this was probably over, over a couple of months, you know, once I figured out what the association was about, once I learned that there was such a thing, um, I knew that I wanted to pursue it. So I reached out to the association and actually got in touch with one of the other master penmen, Michael Sull, who has also become like a dear friend and mentor of mine. And, um, and so I wrote him a letter and I got his address through the association, wrote him a letter and, uh, received back in the mail this like gorgeous letter from him um from my campus mailbox i pulled out this <laughs> envelope with this beautiful ornamental penmanship with these letters that just looked like they were they were dancing all about and um and within it he he gave me a copy of his volume one book and he told me he said jake i'm very excited about your journey into penmanship but before you begin you need to know the history and so it was it was through him that he introduced me to all of these rich characters um, who really formed the golden age of penmanship. These very innovative artists and penmen who who shaped the art form and uh, and raised it to a level that it had, it had never gone to before. And so that was I loved that. I actually for me, that made the experience all the more rich. Um, so. Uh, and and knowing the history also made me have a better understanding of what I was actually chasing after. That's amazing. I can picture there at university and getting <laughs> getting this this beautiful letter. I mean, we can probably all think when was the last time we received a beautifully written card or a letter? And I think yeah. that's kind of the transition I want to make to, you know, I mean, it's it's it, we talk about obviously we're talking about art. Yeah. But but I think we can agree it's it's we're also talking about a almost like a lost art. I, at CLT, we, 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 we do still write handwritten thank you cards, right? Mm. After a meeting with the, with, the, with the school or with the university, you know, we want to we wanna acknowledge them and have that personal touch, but that's, that's rare, right? Mm. We're kind of oddballs mm -hmm. and still doing that. And so you are obviously one, not only a master penman, but also preserving this, what now seems to be a lost art. Now, um, one of the things that maybe some folks don't even consider an art is, is just the writing of cursive. Now, when I grew up, I, I learned how to write cursive, uh, but that mm. is now not the norm anymore. A lot of students, yeah. they, they, you know, they one to one iPad, you know, from from the beginning, they start typing and, and if they're lucky. They learn how to how to actually still write. And if it is probably more print versus cursive. Uh, mm. So talk to me a little bit about what you see as the importance of, of writing in cursive um, 
maybe even developmentally, right, instead of, of typing it and why it's so important to carry on that tradition of cursive writing. Yeah, absolutely. And even though, you know, it's like the the association that I'm a part of, it's it's Iampeth. Um, and so, you know, they actually adopted, they brought in um, teachers of handwriting to be a part of the association um, because it was such a critical part of what they they did. Uh, yes, calligraphy is an art form and Kali means beautiful, graph means to write. So it just means beautiful writing. And that really um, casts a rather large umbrella. Um, and and so beautiful writing is, um, is something that was devised very early on, um, but meant to be practical in the form of cursive handwriting. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and to touch on a bit of like history there. I mean, the, the father of American heritage handwriting, the very first master penman was uh, Platt Roger Spencer. And he believed that God who was the originator of all beauty had instilled his beauty in nature. So if he derived inspiration from nature for his handwriting, then he'd have the beauty of God in his own hand. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, there was this beautiful theology undergirding what he was actually doing. And at that time, there was this this great Western expansion in the United States. And so there was this need for a very practic practical and consistent form of handwriting to be taught in all of these little pop-up independent schoolhouses. And so Platt Roger Spencer's form really kind of took off as, as the ideal form because it was a little bit more efficient. It was easier to write and it utilized, you know, the actual movements of the body to execute. And then from there, you have other master penmen who, who simplified the form even further. Um, you know, Aaron Palmer, uh, he was, he was another master pen, penman who, um, he actually worked for the railroads and he was recording everything that came through on every train car. That was his responsibility to chronicle um, all of the inventory. So he was writing all day long in these huge ledger books. And so he, from, from that, he really developed this form of writing that was really, really efficient. And so he started creating a school curriculum, which propagated through the schools for uh, decades, really. And so that is what we've come to know. So it's, it's rooted cursive handwriting today takes its roots to the same, um, to the same form of like ornamental penmanship, that which I use in my art pieces and special, um, special calligraphic works. Uh, it still traces its roots back to that. And cursive handwriting is, is critically important, um, in this day and age. Well, in any age, really, because it, it's so critical to the formation of uh, the formation and development of the brain, uh, because it's not just, you know, they have found there are studies of like kids who actually sit down and write. Um, and because they're forming the individual words and letters, they have a deeper understanding of the anatomy that make up those letters. And so it's more easy to recognize them on the page when they are written. And so when you actually compound that with a cursive form that links those letters one to another, it creates even more of this interconnectiveness in the brain. And so it was really, it's really cool to see, you know, what, what is playing out on the page is very, very close to what is actually going on inside of our brains. And so it's, it's very important. Um, and I think that we might be seeing a shift back to that. Um, because there was, you know, uh, in around about like 2000, uh, 2010 to 2014, you know, there were a lot of school programs that were taking handwriting out of schools altogether. Um, you know, at least cursive handwriting. And then there were some States like, uh, like Indiana that was requiring no handwriting being taught in the schools at all. It was essentially a send home packet with the parents. Uh, because they thought that all things would be just typed out and there was no, you know, there was no detriment to, to typing versus handwriting. But, uh, um, but it seems like the tide has shifted a little bit because we've seen um, such a decline in, in our children's learning by not having those critical, um, those critical elements of, of writing being taught in the schools. Oh. Yeah, that's 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 real. Thank you for that 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 overview. Um, 
I, that makes sense because I, I, I never taught in the in in the, you know, younger grades in elementary school, but uh, but it was always explained to me that you know writing in cursive also builds fluency, right? Because you are you know connecting the letters and then the words and 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 going through those motions, um, and so I, I I can see that. Um, yeah, being critically important for for younger yeah, for younger I mean, children it, because yeah. it helps it, you know it helps order the letters so that helps kind of fight dysgraphia it creates a um, mm. or, um, dyslexia um, because it creates a, a strong stronger connectivity between the letters and then it also fights dysgraphia which is flipping the letters um, you know backwards um, from what they should be and so by through cursive, there is there's sort of this one way street of execution by not lifting your your hand from the page and the way that they they connect and flow into the next letter um, helps uh, helps cement that more in the brain um, and give them you know give these these growing minds a deeper understanding of the letters themselves. Yeah, I know that that's powerful, and I and I'm noticing even that you know I'm getting lazy, right? Because if you're in your texting or you're on your iPad. You type in two letters that already gives you the word, right? You don't even have to think right. about it anymore. But then when you have yeah. to write, I'm like, wait, how was that again? Right? And so <laughs> if that's doing it to my brain, right, who's actually been taught, you know, spelling and writing and cursive, mm -hmm. uh, I can't even imagine what it can do to, to younger minds and, and really inhibiting mm -hmm. that formation. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about, about, about art, right? So... You know, we don't maybe not think about just learning how to write and write cursive as a, as an art form. But you mentioned the word calligraphy, and and absolutely, we think well, that's that's art, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess make the case for for our listeners. Um, you know, we have Chat GPT now. We have we have AI. I just saw mm. that you can submit like a picture of your face, and it turns it into a, 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 a like a head, professional headshot, right? I mean, there's there's so <laughs> many things now we can do, including I'm sure, and I haven't looked yet, Jake, but I'm sure there's some programs, right, that can do the calligraphy for you. They can do, right? They can do produce a lot of that art artificially. Um, if if there are educators listening, right, and that maybe are struggling with the the, the, the cultural current of like, what's the purpose? Why are we why are we still doing that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure a lot of their students are saying that. What what would you tell them? Maybe words of encouragement, and and how can they encourage their students um, to instill a love uh, for art, for truth, for beauty through calligraphy, through mm -hmm. uh, beautiful writing? Yeah. Um, well, I think educators are right on the they're right on the you know tip of the spear so to speak when it comes to the development and purpose for mm -hmm. um for doing these things for learning the way that we do um i think that you know because it is the reason why you educate yourself is for self development it's not it's not just to be you know to turn something out that is um that is quickly executed. And, you know, it's like, if, if the machine can do it for you, then might as well just abdicate it to, to the machine. And it's like, well, that that's all well and good for the sake of the machine, but what does that actually do for, for your mm -hmm. own personal development? How does that grow you? How does that change the way that you think the way that you function in the way that you perceive the world? Um, because that, that's what, uh, that's essentially what you're giving up. If you abdicate that to, um, to some machine, then that is, uh, then it's your loss. It's not, it's nothing gained. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's really important for us to consider these things going forward. Now I happen to believe that, um, with the rise of things like AI art, um, that there's going to be sort of an inflationary effect to it. Mm. Uh, because the the internet is what it's essentially doing, and I actually um, I gave uh, I gave a talk on this topic and had to do uh, sort of a deep dive into AI art in order to understand it better. But essentially, what it's doing is it's scraping the internet of everything that pre exists and it's sort of rehashing it into something new based on prompts, and um, and it's like that's not really that's not truly generative, you know, that's not true creativity. It has, um, you know, it has all the, the smoke and mirrors of, uh, of this great illusion of being creative, but, um, 
but that's not true creativity. Uh, that's not something that you are actually generating. And um, and even so, if it can, if it's producing something, um, what we value by humans creating is is there is a deeper sense of meaning automatically associated because of the source from whence it came. Because when we look at uh, you know an example that. Um, that I gave recently, you know, there are there are robots now produced that uh, can dance. You know, they they produce these robots at Boston Mechanics that have been able to dance and they've gone viral on YouTube. Um, I only know this because I have a five year old son who's obsessed with robots. So we've seen the dancing robots so many times. Um, but just because a robot can dance, does that does that mean that humans are going to stop dancing? Absolutely not. I mean, I think we cannot help but dance. We cannot help but express ourselves through art forms. And, you know, it's like I look at uh, at my 14-month-old Eloise, and it's like when we turn on the music, she's swaying her little diaper-wrapped hips uh, to the music. And it's like, and her, you know, her awkward little dancing, having just learned to walk a couple, like a few months ago, um, means more to me seeing that than seeing some, you know, robot dance on a screen. And so it's uh, because I think what is reflected there, ultimately, if we get down to the depths of, of this theological argument, what is being reflected there is the imago Dei, the image of God being represented there through the creativity of my daughter, even at that very young age. And so I think it is it is a ra- it would be a rather sad thing for us to tell this next generation no don't worry about creating arts don't worry about writing the next symphony we already have that covered we've got robots to do it go occupy yourself with something else um that that to me is is a very sad future um and and right now I mean I don't um I just see that there's there's going to be a greater drive and desire for for things that are made by hand by humans, um, and so uh, so I'm, <laughs> I better get off of that soapbox before I absolutely no. crush it. But um, <laughs> but that is uh, you know I'm, I what I'm seeing anyways through technology is that there's a lot of unbelievable artists that are being. Re- that are rising up right now doing a lot of these these ancient forms of art that are being restored and brought back to a place of prominence yeah yeah I, and i yeah we want to be hopeful right and i think i think you're absolutely right it seems like the pendulum is is also swinging back you know um and that, that a lot of the things we you know um that maybe technology could do or that maybe you know that, that we're Kind of taking ownership back again and and creating and 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 and, and um so yeah I, I was thinking when you talked about the like what it does to the individual right as you're going through the motions or going through the process i mean at clt we, we do believe that education is fundamentally about formation mm. that it's not just about the end outcome that it's that it's forming you learning latin is as much about what it does to you as a human being then yes. you know being able to to read cicero which is great, yeah. right? um yeah. and so uh and maybe that's part of it right that it's that it's not just yes i can give the internet a prompt and i get this beautiful piece of art but i've 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 i've, I've skipped all the, the the creative process right mm-hmm. that maybe makes me more attentive maybe yeah. it makes me more patient maybe it makes me more uh you know focused on detail and movement and motion um and and if we're if we're if we're just sidestepping that and not and not focusing on that I, i'm wondering what what's going to be lost um l- mm. let me let me ask you about um since we talk about culture and, and what culture values i mean so much is is focused on on what's new what's quick what's expedient right how do you make the case that and I, I think you mentioned that in one of your talks that that art is made to last and that it's made to serve. Mm. How can we preserve art and tradition in this kind of instant gratification culture? How is that possible? Um, you know, I think it's I think it's preserved by uh, 
by using it, you know, I think it's, uh, um, I, I mean, I speak about that in the, in this, uh, in the context of legacy, you know, that legacy is not something that you simply put on the shelf, um, to be admired from a distance, but never used. No, you know, legacy is essentially like a very well honed tool. Um, that is meant to be put to work and it's and it's rehoned and it's resharpened for through every passing generation to be um, to be more useful um, for whoever take takes it up uh, next and so um, so I think the greatest preservation of of the arts in these in these disciplines happen when we when we're actually using them it's it's really the only way that they are preserved um, that, that it happens through human flourishing. Um, so I think that that, that is something that we have to make a very conscious decision of, and we have to make a good argument for, uh, because I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of arguments right now, especially in our technological age that we, you know, we're trying to get, we're trying to raise up our technology in a way so that we don't have to do the work anymore. Um, and, and we view this work, um, as you know, that it is the curse. Um, and, uh, but that's really, that's really wrong. I mean, I think generally from a, from a general like worldly perspective, but, um, from a biblical perspective, you know, work, you know, work was not the result of the fall. Um, it was, it was only the work became harder as as a result of the fall, but, you know, Adam and Eve were given jobs before they fell. And so that, that, that is part of the blessing. That is part of the blessing that we have as children of, of God to actually be able to co-create with him. And so, um, to surrender that, to give that up is to actually reject part of the blessing of what it means to be human and what it means to be made in the image of God. So preserving that is is living more fully into it, um, and and that that is going forward means embodying what it is to be um, to be a really whole person and to develop ourselves in that way um, to you know to love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. So it incorporates the whole person um, in that, and you know it's not just this uh disembodied thing that we're ultimately going after today i think embodiment moving forward will be a very powerful uh and potent thing into our technological future wow amen that is that is powerful yeah no i think that's and i was going to ask you and i think you you've answered it with with that because i listened to your to your ted talk and you talked about um that we should steward art well while it is in our hands, right? And 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 being good stewards of art and, and, and thereby preserving art and, and passing it on to the next generation. And I mean, I, I, it sounds like that's what you're talking about, right? Utilizing this art, using it for the for the right purposes. Um, and and I guess um, uh, highlighting its its value. I mean, even I guess students in, in some Christian schools and some classical schools, they're still asking these questions, right? But what's the point what's the point why, why do i have to do this why is this important right and, mm. and, and 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 i think we have to have some good answers because after they they leave school and they go on tiktok and they they're being told other things right and if we're just yeah. saying well because we say so or because it's you know because it i, I don't know what, what reasons we're given uh giving but um so so i guess you know it, it, the conversation that you're going to have with with your children um, about about the importance of art, the importance of calligraphy, uh, the importance of, of of creating beauty. Um, what are some of the things you you, you focus on um, when you have these, or when you will have? I guess one is a little bit too young to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but what are some of the things you focus on? Because I'm sure some of our teachers listening can 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 get inspired by that. Mm, like when I'm actually talking to kids and trying yeah. to, um, right. wow. Well, I mean, gosh, I, I find, uh, and, and like it, like you said, you know, it's like, um, my kids are really young right now. Um, but I, <laughs> all it really takes at this point is, is, um, uh, is encouragement for, for my kids. Cause they're, you see that they're naturally hungry. 
You know, you see at this age that they're just, they're hungry for life. They're hungry to experience things. They're hungry to learn. And they're, they're always longing to create. Um, so at this point, you know, it's, it's really about encouraging that and kind of fanning to flame that, that's that initial spark. Um, now to, to older kids who may be, who may be a bit jaded, who may be like, um, who may have stepped into the world of like social media and technology and sort of found there the, this sort of like sugary sweetness that, that is always dripping from the vine. Um, say, you know, that's, that's all good, but there's, there's a lacking of substance there. And, and it's like, it's very, um, that will pass away very quickly. You know, it is, it is vanity itself. It is chasing after the wind. Um, and so, you know, it's like actually doing something that has, that has profound meaning of actually developing yourself. It's like, those are the things that are going to create in you a deeper sense of satisfaction and joy rather than just this momentary happiness. Um, but, but in, you know, sorrow is the pledge of joy, as George MacDonald put it, you know, that, uh, that there are, there are some things that are difficult to do. There are some things that we, we may not like in the moment, but it's like once, but, but it's coming through those things and even learning to, uh, appreciate those things for the joy that is ultimately, um, set before us, like that is the ultimate reward. And sometimes it means, it means walking them through that. I think it means, you know, telling them about your own experience and leveling with them in a, in a very personal, um, way, but, uh, encouraging, encouraging them towards that all the while. You know, I think it's, uh, this generation has a lot to show us yet and we can't, we can't, um, I think one thing that it's important for us to do as, uh, you know, people further along in life, uh, is, is to not discredit them before they even get going. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful way to end. Um, Jake, this was, this was, um, yeah, yeah. It gives me a lot to think about. Um, uh, but we of course have one more question, uh, as we always do in the anchored podcast, um, the most difficult question of all, um, what is the one book or one text that, that you can think of that, that maybe has had the most profound impact on, on your own life, personal or, or professional? Ah, uh, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it, by default, of course, I'm going to say, um, uh, to say the Bible, um, because that is, that is like the anchor to my faith. And I know I'm like even trying to, to pick out a, a single book within would be hard, but, um, Outside of that, outside of that Sunday school answer, um, <laughs> I would say, you know, um, gosh, that is, that is actually hard. Um, I would say like one of the most profound books for me has been um, Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. Um, it's It's been such a, he has such a beautiful way of, um, of, a, of expressing um, the world and all of its, in all of its, uh, like deep meanings and, and our relationship to God and God's relationship to us. There's some like really beautiful nuggets in that. And then especially for creatives, he unpacks ideas. Um, like he talks about the, the fairy tale writer and why we love the fairy tale writer. Mm -hmm. Um, because they, you know, they're not, their responsibility is not so much about making new worlds, but making this world new. Like they, the fairy tale writer tells us that the apple is gold to remind us of our initial astonishment when we first discovered that it was green or that, you know, what the rivers ran with wine to remind us of our initial astonishment when we first discovered that they ran with water. Um, so he has this, this unbelievable like way of unpacking theology in a poetic way. And, um, and so that's probably been one of the most in, impactful books uh, to me in my life. Wow. Our, our, our founder and CEO, Jeremy Tate, is going to be really, really happy with that answer. That's his, that's his, his go-to once a year, at least. Um, but it is, it is fantastic. <laughs> and, and Chesterton's sense of humor and, and uh, yeah, his writing oh, is absolutely. Is, he is, is, he is, is absolutely brilliant. Right. I, I can even admit that as, as a Protestant, right? Um, <laughs> 
Well, let me let me do one quick add on, and I didn't prep you for that at all. But um, since we always want to want to inspire uh, our listeners, uh, if, if, if you know, if, if we should look at one piece of art, maybe either whether it's your favorite piece of art or maybe just something that that you've recently saw or rediscovered, or uh, just kind of one of your favorite pieces of art, what, what would you point us to? Uh, wow, one of my favorite pieces of art, for, like from another artist. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, that one's, uh, even harder than the book one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like no sooner choose a favorite star in the heavens, I think is how that phrase goes. Um, you know, uh, some of my, like one of my favorite pieces, of course, everybody knows Michelangelo's, uh, the David, um, but the, uh, the Pieta is, uh, is, that one, I actually got to go to Italy on my honeymoon with my wife. And I remember standing in front of that piece and just, um, and absolutely crying because you just, uh, you know, Mary is in perfect proportion to herself. Jesus is in perfect proportion to himself, but Mary is made larger. Jesus is made smaller because he is one who stoops to conquer. Um, he was made feeble in his death. And so it's like, you just, um, you know, you look at that piece and it's just, it's so incredible. And to think like he was, he was just a young artist. I think he was like 23 or 24 when he, when he completed that piece. Um, but to have, to have all of that, you know, conviction and everything crystallized in stone, um, that's, that's a pretty amazing piece. So yeah, amazing. well, we'll go with that one. Well, that's, that's a good one to go with. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, we're here with Jake Whiteman who is one of only nine master penmen in the world. Jake, thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom, your, your passion for, uh, for art uh, with our audience. And yeah, thank you so much for all you do. We appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Soren.